Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today we're going to talk briefly about homecoming, and then we're going to hear about that in our sailors' own words. Over the last several months, we've had an intern going through our various oral histories, which are all available on a playlist here on the YouTube channel. I've linked that down below. Um, and she's been going through and keywording all of these oral histories so that we know what the folks talking in them uh, talk about. These are oral histories that have been collected over the last two decades, most of which predate uh, our current staff's involvement with the museum here. So uh, we don't entirely know everything that we had. So thanks to some interns, they're going through and looking at that. If you're interested in being an intern, either for a high school or college credit, there's a link in the description below uh, if you'd like to work on a project here on the battleship with us. So one of the topics that uh, comes up very frequently in our oral histories is homecoming. Whether the battleship's only been at sea for a week uh, doing a training cruise, or been underway for the longest deployment since World War II, like she was uh, when she sailed to the Mediterranean in 1983, 1984 during the Lebanese Civil War. Uh, it is a big deal when the ship comes home. Shoot, when I get out of here after a 12 hour work day, it's a big deal when I get to go home and see my beagle again. Here it is in our crew's own words, what it felt like coming into port after uh, months at sea. It's getting a little homesick, I guess. Mm -hmm. oh, sure. Fellas, go on home. Mm -hmm. Really great. See your family and old friends. Made you feel like it's worth it all. Mm -hmm. Well, when we come home, it's kind of odd. We come in the, the fourth time of Virginia where we was discharged. Mm -hmm. and there was five of us guys going down to Salisbury, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and there was no way of getting down there until the next day, and that was on evening. So we wanted to get home, so there's five of us, let's just get us a cab mm -hmm. and go down there. So we flagged one down, there's a woman driving. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, take it, but I'll have to find my husband, he'll do the driving. Mm -hmm. She's off throughout town on two wheels and screaming tired and had me scared to death again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she finally found her husband. Mm -hmm. We all come down there, and that was about two o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and uh, I still had a long way before I could get her way home. Mm -hmm. So I asked the girl at the bus station if there's any way of going out there. He said, just wait a minute. He said, there's a mailman going up that mm -hmm. way. Maybe I can get you right mm -hmm. with him. Mm -hmm. So she called and he said, yeah. So we had a pickup truck and his enclosed in the back, mm -hmm. wires of a side. Mm -hmm. He let me crawl in on that mail mm -hmm. that went into Morgan's yeah. in my hometown. Drawn with Morgan. Yeah, Morganton. Morganton. Yes, sir. North Carolina. And how that, long was the trip from uh, Salisbury to Morganton? Oh, that was only about two hours. Two hours, yeah. You know, one of the things also, because of protesters, I mentioned that, you know, obviously we weren't welcome back, but I never had any experiences. A friend of mine is a combat medic and he said when he got out, he had a rock thrown at him and he, it hit him. And he was called names when he got back and the other guys had some other problems. And they recommended to us that we not wear our uniform home. Um, they said, you know, change in civilian clothes, don't wear a uniform home. And I thought, no way. I thought, I've been over there for three deployments got a handful of, uh, what do you want to say, ribbons or medals or something like that. Um, especially the one with the, the Vietnam Service Medal again, because that wasn't based on deployment, it's just based on where you, when you're over there during campaigns, during certain times, they, there's like 17 or 15 or 16 or 17 things. And, so I got a you know handful of little stars to put on there, and I thought there's no way that I'm going to fly into L.A. without my uniform on. If somebody's got a problem with it, that's 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 their problem, not mine. And um, needless to say, I got a kind of a cool reception in L.A.X. And even I rented a car, and it was less. It was even more cool 
from the rental agency, but nobody ever said anything bad. Um, nobody ever did anything. And, and it, to me, the protesters didn't affect me until the mid seventies when we were pulling out of Vietnam completely. Um, when Saigon fell and the company I worked for then well, it had some economic problems and I was laid off and I don't, I don't say this proudly, but I s applied for jobs, had on my resume, U.S. Navy, and I never heard back from these people. And after a week looking for a job, I told my wife, because I had a, you know, wife, two kids, or one and one on the way at the time, and mortgage to pay, and I thought, I need a job. And I said, I'm going to take off my resume, U.S. Navy. And I started passing out those resumes, and I started getting calls back. As soon as I took that off, that was the prejudice in the mid-70s. Still, they didn't have the riots in, but they still had the prejudice against veterans that if you... And, and, and I've talked to veterans over the years, and... And they said, oh, we're not proud of it, but we had to do the same thing. We had to take off. We're in the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, and in order to get a job. And that was just the fact of life then. We were at the museum, because the first capital of Arizona was in Prescott. We were at the museum there, and one of the volunteers came up to us, and he's 20 years older than I am. And it was Veterans Day, November 11, 1997. And she said to him, are you a veteran? And he said, yeah. He says, I served in World War II. And she said, well, thank you for your service. We really appreciate that. She's real nice to him. Then he, he looked at her and, and he said, he's a veteran too of Vietnam. And she turned to me, stuck out her hand, and said, thank you for your service. We appreciate it. And I thought after 28 years, the first time somebody had said something, thank you for your service because of service in Vietnam. Came home into going into Long Beach. And I was recounting this this morning, you know, once we got there in Long Beach and then the tugboats were tugging us in and, um, there's everything going on, the media, the people out there on the deck, and and the waters, you know, the shooting out, you know. Cannons, water cannons. Yeah, the water cannons from the tugboats and everything else. <clears throat> and then we finally moored into the area there, um, and just hundreds of people out on the dock, you know, going on. And we were all at parade rest. We had to be in our, in licking our best. <clears throat> and then finally when they blew the whistle that we were, Okay. You were all in dress whites? All in dress whites at the mm -hmm. time, yeah. And then uh, they did the whistle that we, you know, we were able to, to leave. And so we scrambled about and, you know, it's just, it, was, it was chaos <laughs> with all the people. And I just recall looking out over the railings, looking for my family. You know, I figured they, they're here. I know they're here. They said they'd be here. And uh, I couldn't, you know, see anyone. And then I heard this voice, you know, I heard this voice say, Mijo, which means my son in Spanish, and it was my mother, you know, and she was like, I don't know how I heard her with all this music and everything else, but I did hear that voice, and, you know, that was just... You were tuned to her. Previously. I was attuned to her. Yeah, there you go, Ron, I was. I always have been, always will be. <laughs> when I got down to 33 Station in Philly, mm -hmm. I was coming out the door, and I was in my uniform, and they gave me a cab. I took a cab home and uh, went from the uh, 33 station down to Fishtown. And uh, it was late at night, and, uh, around 9 o'clock or something like that. And uh, my father and my mother were so little, and a couple of my brothers. But, uh, they were very glad to see me, and uh, 
I mean, they were glad to see me home, I was there. Uh, coming home was really, really great in some ways. Uh, I actually, I say it's in some ways it's the saddest day of my life too. Um, I have two young daughters and a wife and I came home and they were on the pier like everybody else and it was a, it was a glorious scene. Uh, we did have a somber moment on the way into port because Chief Korczynski's wife flew out with Chief Korczynski's remains and we had a burial at sea before we entered port uh, in Long Beach. But uh, uh, we was got that, Was that his desire to be buried at sea? Um, or the family's desire? I, I think it was the family's desire. Uh, no one asked me about that one. <laughs> but uh, it was a somber moment and uh, a remembrance of our chief and senior chief. And, um, but uh, we got home and, and oh my gosh, it was just great big signs of wives and the family were out there, balloons and confetti and all this kind of stuff. And I finally got ashore to uh, my wife and children and my my wife was holding her three-year-old and and uh, my four-year-old was at her leg and my four-year-old came up and rubbed, grabbed my daddy's leg and gave me a big hug and my wife gave me a big hug and I, my daughter that was two when I left and was three when I returned, I missed so much of her life she didn't know who I was and she scared me. That was sad. That was sad. It didn't last long, but that was very sad. You know, you expect that. You know, hope for that great big hug and kiss and everything, and, and she was scared of me. That was tough. We all wanted to come home, okay? Myself, I didn't know that I wanted to come home to something like that, but, you know, when I got home, I found out really it, at that time it wasn't as bad as what was led on to believe. I know my parents, they'd listen every night. A lot of things back in the States, a lot of the media back in the States were saying, oh, the battleship New Jersey, it got hit today, and all these people's hurt and, and everything, and that never happened. It never happened. So, like anything else, I guess there's a lot of stories that goes on, and, and we had a job to do, and we did it, you know? And we had no choice, number one, but there's a difference in not having a choice and believing in what you're doing, and, some some guys probably didn't want to be here for no reason at all, you know, and said, I'm here, I got to do it, so I'm going to do it, you know. When I arrived back at uh, Long Beach, it was a, a super, super homecoming. I mean, the pier was just little, covered with thousands and thousands of people waiting for us to come back. They had tugboats out there in front of the ship with their, with their fire hoses shooting, you know, like fountains of water and you know all kinds of banners flying and helicopters flying around taking pictures and that was that was pretty darn exciting morale is at its peak we were as happy as new rooster in the hen house we were going home that was fantastic there was this one person who had the that was necessary to make the ship look real nice there's one person the gunner's mate pulled turret number two all the way around to the port side. And he was working on the third barrel of turret number two. He was painting the end of the barrel. It looked really, really nice. It was right over top of the skipper's swimming pool. So he had the ladder on it. And it was a fantastic setup. It was really looking good. I have photographs of it. So we're, we're doing our business, doing, our, doing what we're supposed to do. I think it was sometime in early April of 1969. It's in Long Beach. What happens? What's the? What do you recall from that? I can, <laughs> I can pretty much recall everything. It was nice. It was it was exciting. Here is the world's most famous battleship coming up to the piers, and you can see all the ships in front of us. All of the people who are either a glad to see us, or b the war protesters and trying to stop us. Who's going to a sailboat trying to stop a battleship? especially when it's only about 20 feet long. It's not going to happen. So we we came into port. There was a couple of resistors, but mostly it was a family. And I kept looking, and I kept looking, and finally I saw the one person who I was looking for the most. And it was a great, great experience. That was your wife then? That, that, was, my, that was my prior spouse, that's right. So people often ask how long the battleship could have stayed at sea for, since we're talking about homecoming. Uh, at her most economical cruising speed, about 15 knots, the ship could stay at sea for 15,000 nautical miles, which takes approximately one month. However, the ship can do underway refueling 
while at sea and even get ammunition and supplies. So even though uh, the ship might do some cruises that only last a day, she can in theory stay at sea for months at a time being resupplied by other ships. And this allows, especially at the end of the ship's career when there's a very small number of battleships, for these ships to be forward deployed for a long period of time, which makes the crew even happier to get home. What are some things that are fairly common aboard ship that show up in a lot of our oral histories? Remember, there's a link to them down below in the comments section if you'd like to watch through a couple yourself. Uh, what's a future video you would like to hear from our sailors on their experiences about? Let us know in the comments section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate the support you guys have given us, and there's a link in the description below if you'd like to continue supporting the museum. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about the museum and our channel. Thanks for watching.